We are in uh, the fourth week of a series that we've entitled uh, Momentum. We've been talking about our momentum with Christ, our uh, momentum as a church, and how at times we can break that momentum. At times uh, we slow down, we lose momentum. But really uh, what we want to look at is how do we regain it? How do we begin to truly walk with Christ and see what he has in store for us? We've been looking at the truths about momentum and how we are uh, people that are set apart, for the glory of God. We've each uh, been uh, given gifts by God, the greatest gift of all, which was Jesus Christ. He came and he gave his life for us so that we could truly know him and have that relationship with him, but also uh, carry that relationship to the ends of the earth. Momentum builds as we take uh, part in something greater than ourselves. It builds as we uh, are uh, growing and learning more about Christ, more about uh, others around us, and uh, we are walking deeper in our relationship with him. And there's no greater message that we can proclaim than the message of the cross. We can look at Jesus Christ and what he did for us, his great love for us. And as we share that good news, God isn't looking for perfection. He's the perfect one. He just calls us to share our faith, to begin to walk with one another in our relationship with God. Now, we each know that God longs for us to grow in the good news of Jesus Christ. As we walk with him and we see it, see, the good news of Jesus Christ is life-changing. We know that uh, it works in a way that is personal to each and every one of us. We know uh, that we are deeply uh, in, involved in a relationship with him, right? Christ took it so personally that he gave his life on the cross for us to begin to walk with us. And, and I love seeing uh, just that faith worked out in that, that growing of, of the heart and, and, and lives being changed by Christ and what he does. But he wants us to grow up. He wants us to move ahead. We see the church, um, we say this a lot at Family Life, is we see the church as a family. And whenever you think about family, what do you think about? You think about how our goal is to mature and to grow our kids so that eventually what? They will move out and we don't have to deal with them anymore. Now, um, we, uh, we look at uh, faith uh, as a way that we can grow our kids, that we can begin. I mean, unless they're millennials, they'll come back. Um, but um, just, <laughs> uh, but we, we look at it as a way uh, to grow them, to, to encourage them, to, to, to teach them that walk and that faith. I remember uh, growing my kids up and, and beginning to just pour uh, life into them. I loved uh, one of the times my girls were probably about three or, or four years old, and they'd been running around the house, and one of them comes up to me, and she's got her hand on her chest, and she runs right up to me, and she kind of looks at me, and she says, my heart is beating. And I was like, Yeah. I said, that's really good that your heart is beating. She's like, no, I can feel it. You know, I, I can feel it beating. I can feel it moving. And it's just, she was in awe of her heart just beating. I was thinking about the, how beautiful that is whenever it comes to our relationship with God. Because really, for the first time, when we start that right relationship with him and we surrender our lives to him, our heart truly begins to beat correctly for the first time. When we surrender our heart to him and we give our life to him, we begin to beat in a different way and we feel our heart differently. We feel our life walk with him differently. And it's been great to see my, my girls, if, if my girls you who are 15, uh, that 14, if uh, I keep wanting to make them older than they are, who are 14, uh, if, if they were to come up to me and uh, they were to say, my heart is beating, I would look at them like, what are you talking about? It's not as big of a deal as whenever they're three to do that. But now we have different conversations. We talk about how God is working in their lives. We talk about how uh, he's changing them and he's rearranging them. And uh, he's really, truly uh, moving in and of uh, their heart and their life. And there's this growth that takes place. And we, we see our kids whenever they're young and how they walk in such a, a, a just pure way. With Christ, and then they grow in the faith, and it becomes something greater and something more, and that's what we each long for. I'm blessed to uh, have a, a staff with younger kids, and 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 to have that. One of my favorite things is on Monday morning, uh, Anna Weisgerber, who is our worship pastor's uh, daughter, Anna will come into my office on uh, Monday afternoons, and she will always bring me something that she learned in church. 
Uh, a couple weeks ago, she comes in, and I, I hear her coming through the door, and she's like, I've got this letter for Robbie. I've got to take this letter to Robbie. And uh, so she comes into my office, and she brings me this letter, and she lays it down on my desk, and I look at it, and I said, what is that? And she said, well, it's Jesus. And I said, okay, I, I see that, but, but tell me the, the story of it. And she said, well, that's Jesus, and he healed the man who was death with Pop Rocks. And I said, what? And she said, she said, that's Jesus. And he healed the man. He couldn't hear. He healed him with pop rocks. And I thought, well, that's not a story of the Bible I've ever heard. I mean, I knew different ways that Jesus healed and the power of the Spirit and everything else. But I hadn't really heard where he had healed with pop rocks. And so I asked her, I said, explain to me how he did that. And she, you know, she's young. She couldn't really just kind of lay it all out there. So I went out and found her mom. And I said, explain to me what it is. And they said, well, in, in Sunday school, they, they were together. And they were learning. And they were growing. And they were talking about this message. And they wanted the kids to understand what it meant to really, truly hear and so they gave the kids pop rocks. And you know, if you put pop rocks in your mouth, you can hear them popping in, in your ears. And uh, they gave that as kind of an illustration of, of that. And I thought, man, what a, what a beautiful way that is to kind of lay it out there. How God in his spirit comes into us and he begins to speak to our hearts. And we can't truly hear or fathom all that God has for us until he, what, reveals himself to us. And the sounds and the beating of our heart and the actions of our life begin to change. And God begins to speak through his word and through the, the power of others into our lives and into our hearts. And he grows us. And we're all called to grow. We, we join together with God as he leads us to more life. We, we grow as we, we hear more about his word and about his truth, about his great love for us. And God longs for us to grow in the good news of Jesus Christ. He doesn't want us just to stay uh, in an elementary learning of the gospel. He wants us to take the gospel and bring it into every aspect of our life, everything that we're doing, every heartbeat that we have, every moment of every day. And that's really what Paul is going to say to the Corinthians is, hey, you've got to move in your faith in a way that you're growing. And that you're challenged. And so my prayer for you guys this week, as I've been looking over this message and, and just praying about it, is that God would begin to mature us and to grow us in our faith. Will you pray with me? Father, I can honestly say, God, that I haven't grown as much as I want to at times, God. And, and really, that's not because of you. It's because of me. God, you pour certain things into my life, and you open my eyes to certain scripture, but I don't necessarily truly put them to heart. And God, if, if we're honest with ourselves, we should at times be further along in our faith and our walk and, and just what you provided for us, God. But we break momentum. God, we wreck ourselves. We, we get distracted by things of this world. We place other things uh, above you as important in our lives, God. God, my, my prayer this morning is that we would look to your word and that you would open our eyes to see how we can truly grow in you. God, you long to move through us and you long to move in us. God, you loved us so much that you sent your son to die on the cross for us. We praise you for that today, God. So God, move us to a deeper faith, God. Move us to a greater knowledge of your grace, your love, and your power in our lives, God. Move us for your glory. In your name we pray. Amen. If you've got your Bibles, we're going to be in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, we've been talking about uh, the church at Corinth. We've been talking about how uh, God has moved him. And if we know anything about uh, the church in Corinth is, or the Corinthians as a whole is they longed for progress. They longed for something more. They wanted to grow intellectually. Uh, they wanted to grow materially. They wanted to grow in many ways, and the church was no different. They wanted to grow in their faith. They desired knowledge. And they followed some pretty good leaders, if we kind of look at it. You know, one of their leaders was Paul, another was Apollos, uh, who we don't know a whole lot about, but we know a guy by the name of Peter, and these were guys that they followed and they heard the teachings of, and so there was a pretty good uh, line on wisdom. Uh, there's a pretty good line on maturity in the faith. 
Uh, there was a pretty progressive way of thinking about uh, the truth of God. I mean, they were on the cutting edge, right? The gospel had just begun to spread through the world. And so this truth was coming out. And everything was pretty much stacked in their favor. I mean, can you imagine having Paul as one of the pastors of your church? Can you imagine having Peter uh, preaching to you on a daily basis? Can you imagine those truths being uh, proclaimed and out there? And everything was in their favor, but there was a problem. They weren't quite growing. They weren't growing in their faith. They weren't growing uh, deeper in their relationship. And, and, and some of them had kind of backtracked and begun to live uh, in the old ways of their life. And they weren't living as God had called them to. They were living as the world. And so we've been looking at uh, the story of the Corinthians and how there were fightings and, and, and arguments. There was uh, divisions and struggles. There was a lot of sin going on and a, a lot of heartbreak and struggle that was happening in the church uh, during this time. And so Paul began to write them and began to tell them that they're supposed to grow. We're, we're supposed to be living in such a way that we grow. Living things are supposed to grow, right? They're supposed to get bigger. Whenever they don't get bigger, we kind of are concerned about them. We wonder, if you're not living, you're dying. And growth is a natural sign of health. If you see uh, something growing or someone growing in their maturity or uh, growing in, in school or, or different ways about them, uh, you can see uh, that that's a sign of health and wisdom. And the beauty of it is that every believer has the potential for a thriving relationship with God. Every one of us, if we've accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we have the potential to have a deep, growing relationship with God. Not just a uh, kind of um, tertiary, not just a uh, kind of um, at times uh, hot and at times cold faith. We have the potential to be fully in love with God and to have him fully moving in our lives. The problem with the Corinthian church is they had that same potential, but they weren't living up to it. They weren't walking in it. So Paul begins to, or continues to write them in chapter 3 of 1 Corinthians. He says this, brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not yet ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. You are still worldly, for since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere humans? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not mere human beings? What, after all, is Apollos? And what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe. As the Lord is assigned to each his task, I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything but only God who makes things grow. The one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose, and they will each be rewarded according to their labor, for we are co-workers with God's service, and you are God's field. The Corinthians longed for progress. They long for something more. And then Paul looks at them in this moment and he separates believers into two categories. Mature and immature. Growing and, and living in their faith and stagnant. Stepping backwards. Not really truly following with what they believe. We all if we're honest with ourselves, we, we want to grow, right? We want to be more. We want to do more. We want to uh, move forward. We want to progress. If it's, if it's a job, we want to get raises. We want to move up in the company. We want to do better. If it's um, school, we want to learn more. We want to graduate. We want to move on to the next phase of life. If it's our marriage, we want it to, to grow and, and be more romantic at times and, and move in a direction that is God-honoring. If it's our kids, we want them to grow up in amazing ways and, and be free uh, to live for God and all they have. We want to get better. We want to grow. The world around us is, is, is pretty much the same way, right? It's, it's, it's filled with this concept of finding fulfillment, self-help, building happiness and, and meaning and, and growth and, and, and momentum. Those are godly concepts. 
But what happens when we're not growing? Or what's at fault when we're struggling in it? See, believers mature and grow by allowing the Spirit of God to teach them, by allowing God's Word to feed them directly. The Corinthians were trying to achieve spiritual growth, but they were going about it the wrong way. Problems arose, and uh, they were taking focus off of what really mattered, and they were struggling in their faith and where they were at. Immature Christians living for the things of the world have little to do with the Spirit. They are so wrapped up in, in the things around them, what others think or, or what society tells them or where they're at, that they don't truly listen to the voice of God. And the Corinthians were easily distracted, and they had forgotten the dangers that were around them. And see, that's how we get at times, right? We become lazy in our faith. We become complacent in our walk, and we think that everything's fine. We'll just drift along, and we don't see the danger that's around us. Years ago, I used to take uh, our uh, students, whenever I was a youth pastor, uh, we would go uh, to Silvercliff Ranch. One of the things that we did every year was we would go whitewater rafting. It was one of my favorite things to do. We'd been uh, probably, you know, I don't know, six or seven times at the time that we went, and uh, I'll never forget it. One of the things that they would tell us as we went whitewater rafting was never uh, underestimate the power of the water. You see the water that's flowing under you, and it may be uh, flowing smoothly, but there are different currents and different things that can take you out. So even if the water appears to be moving slowly, you can get drug under at any moment. It can take you out. Uh, they told us that when we uh, were to uh, accidentally at times fall out of the boat, if we were in the rapids or a problem went, that we were to immediately look and figure out where we were at. We were to find the boat or find the shore and whichever one we were closest to, we would swim to as fast as we could. They called it aggressively self-save. You would figure out where you're at. You wouldn't stand up because if you stood up, your toe could get uh, caught in a rock and the water pressure would carry you under and you would drown. And so what they would tell you is don't stand up, just swim. So look for the shore, find the boat, and aggressively self-save. So I'd make sure that I would hammer this into our students and make sure they knew uh, everything, and we would head off on the boat. Now, the great thing about uh, Noah's Ark is they would take us out, and they had a, a captain that would uh, care for us and everything else, a guide, a river guide that would guide us and be there for us and everything else, and they would protect us and make sure that we knew everything. We paddled when we needed to paddle. We did the things that we needed to do, but really, they were steering, and they were in control of everything, and we were just kind of enjoying the ride. Well, this uh, particular time we were out and we were going along and it was one of the smoother parts of the river. And uh, the beautiful thing about it is we would hit rapids and then we would go through a smooth part. We hit some rapids and we'd go through a smooth part. And we were kind of in a, a low, smooth part. It was really glassy and just really scenic. And we're just all just kind of laying around and just hanging out and just enjoying the ride. Well, as I was sitting there enjoying it, I started looking over the side of the boat, and I began to see the rocks and the different things that were coming along and, and everything else as we would pass by them. And I thought, man, I wonder how deep this water is, because you could see the rock. And, you know, everything looks kind of closer through the water and everything else. It magnifies it. And so I was, well, I was I wonder if, if I could touch the bottom with my um, oar. And so I got my paddle, and I took it, and I kind of poked a little bit, and I poked a little bit, and I was like, man, it's not that deep. And so I poked, and as I poked, my um, paddle got caught between two rocks. We weren't going fast, so it was really slow motion. And so my paddle, as we're there, we're moving it down, my paddle begins to slowly come towards me. And I'm just watching it, just watching it. It presses against my chest, and I'm just calmly watching it as it flips me backwards and into the water. Now, I flip out because I hit the water, and, man, that water is cold. Uh, I, I think I'm one of the only people to fall into the water when there were no rapids. Uh, I, uh, I fall into the water, and, and what do I do? Immediately, I'm like, I've got to aggressively self-save. So I come up, and I look around, and I see the boat. 
And so I like paddle as fast as I can. I mean, I'm looking like I'm not a, a master swimmer or anything like that. And I've got a life jacket on. So I'm paddling, dog paddling, doing everything I can. I'm just going nuts, going crazy. I'm, I'm going to show the kids how you aggressively self-save and try to redeem myself in this really awkward situation. And so I'm paddling as fast as I can. I get to the side of the boat and I grab across the side of it and I try to pull myself up and I am not going anywhere. I can't get in the boat. I mean, I'm trying everything I can. I can't get in the boat. I can't get in the boat. I've got kids grabbing a hold of me and they're trying to pull me in. If, if, if they pull too hard, I'm going to pull them in the water with me. Suddenly our uh, riverboat guide jumps up, leaps across the boat, reaches down, grabs me by one hand, shoves me under the water, and with one hand rips me to safety. I looked her <laughs> in the eyes and was like, thank you, you saved my life. I always joke, she, she was a hockey player, man. She was a tough chick. Um, she, was, she, she had bigger biceps than I did. Uh, you know, she, 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 was, she knew what she was doing. But, but, but regardless, in that moment, you know, I, I didn't care that she was a woman, I just needed to be saved. You know, I didn't care that, that I was going to look weak. I didn't care uh, that, that others were going to laugh at me. I, didn't, I just wanted to get out of the water. Where are we at today? Are we aggressively self-saving? Are we trying to get in the boat and we can't? Or worse yet, are we just floating along? Do we not care to even get back in the boat? Do we not care to be saved? We've got our life jacket on. We're not going to drown. We're just going to drift on. Or will we allow the Savior to truly reach into our lives and pull us to safety? See, the beauty of being in the boat is that you have an impact. You can determine where the boat's going to go. You can decide uh, how things are going to be done. You can communicate with others. If you're not in the boat, if you're not a part of it, what are you doing? You're, you're aimlessly drifting on your own in need of rescue. But in the boat, you're secure and you're safe. And I'm not using this as an analogy. I'm not talking about how we're already saved, but there are times when we drift away. There are times that we struggle in our faith and we lose sight. And every believer has the potential to be in a thriving, growing relationship with God, but many are out drifting on their own. So Paul writes to the Corinthians and he begins to speak to them about how they're not growing in maturity. What are the marks of maturity? Well, they're simple. Focus, you know what you want. Um, a mark of maturity is connection. You can communicate. You know what God wants. You know what others have going on in their lives. Another is humility. Someone who is uh, mature is humble. They know their place. They don't talk a lot about themselves. They talk a lot about others. A mature person is obedient. Follows God in his way and his will. But the immature believer knows the facts, but doesn't dive into the whole truth of what it really means to be completely surrendered to the glory of God to make an impact for his glory. Some, some things um, have to change in our life for us to begin to, to do that. And, and Paul kind of slaps him in the face. Uh, you don't really expect this in the middle of, of the, after he's already gotten over him, uh, onto him about some stuff, but he comes back and he says, brothers and sisters, I could not uh, address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still what? Worldly. Mere infants in Christ. I mean, uh, I think many of us would be uh, offended if somebody was to call us a baby. You know, that's probably one of the biggest uh, insults I, I heard as my kids growing up. You know, when one would complain, what do the others two immediately do? You're a baby. You're a baby. Just grow up. But Paul in this moment is calling them that. He's calling them a baby. And this is why... Why he does it? Because he wants them to change. Jared McCoy says that we must embrace change even when change, what, slaps us in the face. And sometimes God has to slap us in the face to get us in line with him. Sometimes he has to come along and get our attention. 
Sometimes we're so busy not paying attention to what's going on, we put ourselves in that situation. And God allows it to happen. So we have to look and say, what got us here? And what's going to take us further with God? Well, the beauty of it is that what got us here will get us there. It's going to take us into a deeper maturity. The gospel, we have to grow deeper in our faith. What got us here, the gospel, is going to get us there. The good news of Jesus Christ got us into a right relationship with him. And the good news of Jesus Christ is going to continue to grow us and move us in a direction that changes our heart. It's important that we preach the gospel to the lost. We have to preach the gospel to the lost. They have to hear that message. But it's also important that we reiterate the gospel to the saved. It's because of of, of the grace of Christ. It's because of the love of God that we've been set free. And now we can live in freedom. Paul knew this full well. He wanted the Corinthians to understand that they had lost momentum. Look here in verse 2. He says, I gave you milk, not solid food, for you are not quite ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. You're still worldly. For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere humans? Well, yeah, we're human. We're broken. We're flawed. But Christ calls us to be set apart for his glory. That's the good news of Jesus Christ, that we can be. Our sins can be forgiven by the finished work of the cross. By Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, we are set free from the bondage of sin so that we can what? Live for his glory. Here and now, God calls us. See, the believers in Corinth had started off so great. They started off really well, but they had lost sight of all that God had given them. And we've talked about that, how God had set them apart and he had called them and he had gifted them with many uh, different just uh, callings and, and abilities. But what did they begin to do? They began to fight amongst themselves. They began to take their eyes off of the Savior They begin to compare themselves to one another and look at others and say, man, this one is better than this one. And this battle and this raging of division and jealousy and arguments built in them. Until they were at a point where they were looking at their lives and saying, why can't I grow? Have you ever asked that question about your faith? God, I I want a deeper relationship with you. God, I I want to know you more. God, God, I'm longing uh, to to, to understand and to hear your voice. Why can't I grow? I think we've all come to uh, a point in our lives uh, at times where we're like, we want to grow and we want more, but we're just not there. It's just not making sense. We're not moving in the right direction. And Paul was saying in essence to them that lives lived in contrast to the fruit of the Spirit won't hear the voice of God. And what is the fruit of the Spirit? Well, we know in Galatians chapter 5 that the fruit of the Spirit is this. It's love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passion and desires. And since we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Why can't we grow? Because we've stepped out of step with the Spirit. We've fallen out of the boat. We've gotten comfortable with the ways of this world. We've been distracted by other things that are around us, and the waves of this world have what carried us off. We didn't take maybe seriously at times and and we drift away when we get so wrapped up in this world and we live in contrast to the fruit of the Spirit. And that's truly where the Corinthians were at. I mean, you can honestly say there was no love in their life because they weren't living for one another. There's battles and there's, how can you be fighting with one another and have true joy? How can you have peace? They refused to be patient with one another. 
They weren't gentle. They weren't self-controlled. They weren't faithful to what God had called them to. They were living for themselves. And many of us want to honor God. We have that deep desiring potential, that deep desiring ability. But we don't. Why? Because we live for the things of the world. The things that pull us away. Those pleasing uh, attributes of of life. And, And really they're not all bad in and of themselves. But they're not the glory that God wants for us. So we take our eyes off the Savior. And we live for ourselves and not for him. Have you ever, it's kind of a rhetorical question because I know it already, but, but have you ever made a wrong decision in your life? Yeah, no, nobody has, right? Nobody's ever made that wrong decision. They've never done that, that wrong thing. We don't, we don't like to uh, admit our mistakes, right? I don't like to tell the story of how uh, I uh, stuck my paddle in a uh, river and got thrown into the water in front of a bunch of teenagers, right? I don't like to talk about that. We don't like to talk about our flaws. We don't like to talk about the ways that we fall short. But God wants us to be honest about who and where we are. And the crazy thing about it is, is that we don't have to hide anything from God because we can't hide anything from him. He already knows the mistakes that we've made. He already knows how much we've let him down. He already knows how bonehead at times our decisions are. And yet what? He loves us. He cares for us. Even when we were in deep-seated rebellion against him, when we were running uh, for our own desires, he what? Died on the cross in our place. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us so that we could know him, so that we could walk with him and and truly understand his love and his grace and his power. But we don't want to admit that. But we need to. We need to daily admit, God, I'm not enough. And really, that's what we're doing by aggressively self-saving is we're swimming to the only hope we have. There's hope in only one person, and that's Jesus Christ. He's the only life that we have. We can swim towards fame. We can swim towards worldly relationships. We can uh, swim towards, you know, whatever we want to. But if we're not swimming towards the life giver, we're lost and headed for destruction. We need his hope and his help. See, it's not enough just to follow good leaders. We have to connect ourselves with the only source of life, Jesus Christ. There are a lot of good teachers out there, and and really, if we look at the church of Corinth, they had some really great teachers from what we understand about Apollos. We don't know a lot about him, but he was a, a great and powerful preacher. He brought the word, and we know that Paul was an amazing writer and knew uh, a lot about the faith and was there to bring it, and, and we know Peter at times was one of the boldest pastors there were, but their job was not to follow Paul or Apollos or Peter. They were to follow Christ. In Christ alone. The entire New Testament is a beautiful interpretation. It's a beautiful application of what? The gospel. The good news of Jesus Christ. We see through the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that Christ came and he gave his life for us. And we see through Acts and Romans and all the letters and uh, even into Revelation what it means to truly follow Christ and to live for him and how one day Christ will return for us. And what matters is how we're going to live our life now. Will we truly surrender everything that we have to him? Believers in Christ practicing love seeking to get along with one another, using their lives to point others to Christ. That's what he calls us to. But you know, there's something about children that's real interesting. They can say the sweetest things and at the same moment turn around and drive you insane, right? We just put three of them in a car together 
It doesn't matter their age. I mean, it can be anywhere from three to, uh, you know, I don't know, uh, 18, 35. I don't know. Just put siblings together, right? Just put them together. At some point, somebody's going to what? Look at them wrong, jab them, or, or say something, right? Uh, in, our, in, our, uh, in our car, sometimes it's, it's they sing the wrong words to a song. You know, um, like, like instead of singing like ships in the night, they sing like chips in the night or something, you know, simple like that. <laughs> that was my daughter. <laughs> Sorry, babe. They sing the wrong words, right? Or, or whatever they, they do wrong or they, they kind of motivate or, or push the one in, in a direction and then the fight is on, right? Then it's don't look at me. Don't touch me. Don't breathe. I hate you, you know, and it kind of grows and it moves and it's like, when are we going to get out of this car? You know, or, or try to get them to choose a place to eat dinner that they all like. Not going to happen. You know, there's these fussing and this arguing and, and, and this, this it. and so whenever Paul is talking to the church at Corinth, he's saying, man, you guys are like kids. You fight like crazy. Not only that, you're fighting over really silly stuff. I mean, think about it. Growing up, did you ever have that argument with somebody? My dad can beat up your dad. Anybody ever have that argument? Yeah, my kids never did because they knew that their dad would always lose. (laughs) But in this case, in this case, you know what they're doing is they're doing, my spiritual daddy can beat up your spiritual daddy. Because my spiritual dad's Paul and you just got Peter. You know, or, or my spiritual daddy's Apollos and, and he can do this. And so they're fighting over these silly, just trivial things. And if, if you ever notice, those are the things that I think at times divide us the most, right? Is the trivial things. It's the little things that weigh us down. It's the little things that really don't matter. They just get in the way because we allow them to. We become distracted over them. One other problem with them was, you know, what do, what do kids love to do? They love to, to show off, right? Look at me, 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 right? My son uh, will not say anything without saying dad 25 times first until I look at him and I say, yes, Jackson. They, they want that. They want to be seen, and, and that's where the Corinthians were at. They wanted to be seen. They enjoyed showing off their gifts. They enjoyed showing off their spiritual pedigree. They just enjoyed showing off their knowledge. And worse yet, they weren't interested in serving one another. They weren't interested in edifying one another. What's the gift of the Spirit for? What, what, what are we giving these gifts for? To what? Edify and lift up the church to encourage one another, but they were too busy saying, look at what I can do. Look at who I am. It would have been pretty silly for me whenever I was swimming to that raft to stop and say, now look, children, I am an amazing swimmer. Acknowledge my technique, right? No, I didn't care. I didn't care what my technique, I was paddling with all that I had just to get there. We get so wrapped up in our others looking at us, our others noticing us, that we forget to point them to the one that matters, the Savior. Our job is not to make much of ourselves. Our job is to make much of Christ. Unfortunately, the Corinthian church were inwardly focused. I mean, what's the most inwardly focused thing you know? It's what, a baby, right? They don't know any better. They, they don't know any better, but as you grow and as you mature, what do you begin to do? You begin to live outside of yourself. We really have the, the, the concept of when you were growing up is that when, when you left the room, all life ceases to exist. You know what I mean? You didn't really ever think about what anybody else did until you entered the room, and then finally, you know, it's like everything froze. You left, and then you came back in, and everything began to, what, revolve around you again. We as believers at times still get stuck in that mentality of life revolves around us. It's all about me. And we can't grow and we can't be effective when we have that mindset. We have to think outside of ourselves. Why? 
Because growth and ministry go together. Growth and ministry go together. I used to always tell people whenever I would try to get them to volunteer in youth and stuff like that, you want to you learn more about yourself, you want to grow in your faith, come and serve. Why? Because when we serve, we grow. When we get outside of ourselves and we live for something greater than ourselves, we grow the heartbeat in, of ministry and spiritual growth is what? Serving others. When we are serving others, ministry grows out of it. But not only that, we grow spiritually. The greatest times that I grow in God is whenever I'm trying to live for him. And what is ministry? Basically, it's this. Loving, feeding, and caring for others, right? That's it. Whether it's spiritually, whether it's emotionally, whether it's physically, it's loving, caring for, and feeding others. And when we do that, we step out of ourselves and we begin to grow. Paul knew that. Verse 5, he says, What, after all, is Apollos? And what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe. As the Lord is assigned to each his task, I planted and Apollos watered, but God has been making it grow. Notice what Paul does here. He, he takes the focus off of himself. He, he takes the focus off of Apollos. He says, hey, what, what is Paul? He doesn't say who is Paul. He says, what is Paul? What's Apollos? A servant. A servant. You see, true growth is always given by God. True growth, growth only comes from God. We're just the servants. We live to serve. Servants are the messenger. Jesus is the message. And if we are in Christ Jesus, that's our goal. We're servants. He calls, he calls us to what? Do like he did to become the least of these. To begin to serve others. To put them first. If we're really going to grow, we're going to serve those around us with love, with joy, with patience, with peace with self-control, with faithfulness. We're to give all that we have for the glory of God. And the only way to grow is to lean into the source. I mean, think about it. When, when, when you get a drink of water, are, are you more excited about the cup or the water? I mean, if you're dying of thirst and you just got to have a drink, are you really concerned about what kind of cup you use? No, you don't even care if it's clean. Just give me some water. Jesus is the water. We're just the cup. I mean, when I was a kid, we would do weird things like drink out of a faucet or a water hose. Right? We didn't even need a cup. All the kids were like, oh, that's so gross. No, nah, man, we're still alive. We don't care. We just want the water. We want the life-giving source. And the only way to grow is to lean into the life source. And the only way to help others grow is what? To connect them with the source. And that's what God calls us to do. You see, if God calls, or if God gives the growth, then, then no one of us is more important than the other. No one of us is better than the other. And even though we're all different, that difference makes us, corporately, better. It brings glory to the Father. See, difference doesn't imply division. It calls for unity and diversity. I can carry a cup, or I can carry water differently than you can. I can carry water to people that you can't, but you can carry water differently than I can. And you can carry water to others that I can't. And we all have this call to live for him. And when we recognize that God is the source of growth, we can begin to celebrate when others succeed. We can begin to celebrate when others serve. We can begin to celebrate when others love. And like Brandon said, you know, some of us uh, overly hug. Some of us just give a high five. But that's what people need, right? They need to be loved. 
They need to be pointed to the source. Thankfully, we don't have to carry the weight of growth. I mean, any of you ever grow a plant? I mean, we kill plants at my house, but anybody ever grow a plant? I mean, you know, you, you don't just sit there and just will that plant to grow, right? You water it, you feed it, you make sure it's in the sunlight. But who gives the growth? Not you. It's God. And, and thankfully, we don't have to carry the weight of growth in ourselves or in others. That responsibility belongs to God. But what do we have to do? We have to stay in touch with the source. And we have to connect others to the source. You see, we press in and we serve with all that we have. And the Holy Spirit moves in and through us for the glory of God. Growth is given by God as we sink deeper and deeper into our relationship and the realities of the gospel. See, to grow fruit, to grow fruit, we have to what? We have to allow God to grow us. And we must grow fruit. We must bear fruit by giving of ourselves. And as we serve others, we care for the soil of God. We water it, some plant, some water, some tend, some reap. But God makes it grow. If you don't walk out of here with anything today, I want you to walk out with this thought. Craig Rochelle says this. He says, what you keep is all that you have. What you keep is all that you have. But what you give, God multiplies. What I keep in myself is all that I have. But as I give it to others, and as I share with others, and as I love others, as I water as I tend, as I plant, God multiplies it. How do we grow? We don't keep it inside of ourselves. We don't keep the gospel to ourselves. We share it. We serve. And we love. We pray with me. Father, we thank you for your truth and for your word, God. God, we ask you today, God, that you forgive us because at times we are mere infants, God. Our immaturity, God, runs rampant. And God, I pray today that you would begin to move us from immaturity to maturity, God. That you would grow us up in you. God, that we wouldn't hold things in for ourselves, but we would allow you to move through us, God. God, use us to grow others. Use us to plant. Use us to um, tend. Use us to water. Use us to reap, God, but you do the work of growing. You work in and through us, God. Let us not hold back, but let us give as you multiply. And God, my prayer is always, if there's someone in this room that doesn't know you as their Lord and Savior today, they would see their great need for you. The good news of Jesus Christ is that you gave your life when we were hopeless, helpless, and lifeless so that we might have life everlasting, God. God, my prayer today is that they would turn their eyes to you and see their great need for the Savior and they would give their lives to Christ. For the rest of us, God, may we live daily in the gospel, building momentum as we serve you with all that we are. In your name we pray, amen.